Welcome to the last panel uh, of this conference, uh, which is on the subject of measurement. And uh, it's, a, it's a bit of an innovation that we're trying for this panel, because uh, unfortunately two of the uh, panelists at the last moment couldn't make it uh, to be physically here, so we're connecting them electronically, as you can see uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, operate as if they were effectively here, which I'm sure will work in a completely seamless fashion. So measurement is the topic that everyone mentions as being absolutely critical to making anything to do with corporate purpose work in practice. And measurement at the same time is what many people regard as being almost impossible to do uh, in relation to corporate purpose. So we're going to, in this final panel, try and square that conundrum to find a way of identifying how companies and investors and the population at large can evaluate whether companies are really putting their purposes into practice and whether or not they've got the resources that are needed to do that. Uh, and in the process, we'll be touching upon questions such as, to what extent is the notion of measuring corporate purpose different from measuring ESG or sustainability uh, issues more generally? Is there something specific about the way in which one wants to measure corporate purpose. And we're going to, we've got four uh, panelists this afternoon, uh, Paolo Lanzarotti, uh, Gaishka Omazabel, Kartik Ramana and Judith Stroll, who are both online. Uh, and as I said at the start, we're not going to uh, introduce the panelists. We're just going to go straight into the discussion and we're going to, they're going to give short uh, introductions about it for about seven minutes each uh, and we'll go in the order of Paolo, Geishka, Kartik and uh, Judith. So we're going to start off uh, by hearing from Paolo. Uh, so if you could perhaps begin and if you could speak into the microphone so everyone can hear. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. Hi, everybody. So I'm Paolo Lanzarotti from Asahi Europe and International. We are a brewer. Uh, we operate mostly out of Europe. Um, about 45 million hectoliters of beer. That's just about 10 billion servings produced uh, and 11,000 colleagues. Um, and we've been on a purpose discovery or rediscovery journey, actually, starting with a conversation with Colin uh, about five years ago, where I was asked by Colin the question, what problem does your business exist to solve profitably? And I wasn't able to give an answer. Uh, I, I mumbled something along the lines of, we're here to produce beer, we're here to build brands, we're here to serve the community, but I wasn't able to succinctly answer that, 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 that one question. And I think it's an important question because ultimately you need to be able to measure the answer of that question. Um, so I parked the problem. We didn't talk about purpose in the business for a couple of years. Um, then we did a piece of strategy work, we brought in the usual suspects to do some consulting for us. And we figured that we could solve the, uh, the, the discovery of, uh, of our purpose in a two-week process. Uh, that didn't work either. So we parked the problem for another six months. And then we mobilized uh, quite a big team uh, across the business uh, from all functions and from all levels of the business. And we took about a six-month period to, to rediscover our purpose, which is to create meaningful connections. So that's why we exist. We don't exist to produce the best we're in the world. We do. We don't exist to build brands. We do. We exist to create meaningful connections. And we broke that down into two sort of sub-goals. Uh, the first be, being to become a force for planet positivity. Um, without water, without barley, without yeast, um, we, we have no reason to exist. We have no product to, to sell. So you know, upstream of us, we need the world to be a better place than it is today. And the second goal is, is all about creating, uh, serving up uh, an experience 
uh, a positive and inclusive experience for, for society. So there's a societal aspect of, of, of this notion of creating meaningful connections. Um, we started our process having rediscovered our, this, this, uh, this, this, this uh, purpose of creating meaningful connections very, very focused internally. So engaging internally with getting people to grapple with what does this mean? You know, beyond a strap line, beyond a screensaver, beyond a, a beer mat with, uh, with creating meaningful connections, what is the implication of this rediscovery going to be to, our, to us, for us? What processes are we going to change? What decisions will we make that are different to the decisions we've made potentially historically? And how will we know that we're successful? So what are the measurement criteria for understanding whether those decisions are moving in the direction of the purpose that we've uh, redefined for ourselves. So when it comes to measurement, and, uh, and I'll finish, um, we've, there are three sort of things that, that, that we, we discovered. The first is, we're not, don't overcomplicate things. So start with what you've got. Uh, we measure engagement, we measure brand health, we measure uh, carbon emissions, we, we, we measure water usages. All of these measurements are part of our normal operational routines. Start with what you've got. Um, the second point that, that, we came, that became quite obvious was link everything that you have back to the narrative. So if creating meaningful connections is our purpose and our water usage is reducing within our breweries because of the operational changes we're making, bring that KPI back to the, the broader narrative. So start with what you've got, link what you've got back to the broader narrative, but ultimately, there does, it, it, we found that uh, there is a requirement to have a top-down overarching goal or measurement, and that for us has been the, um, the development of something we call sustainable EBITDA, um, where we essentially cost in the internal cost of carbon and internal cost of plastic, notwithstanding the fact that those costs don't actually exist in our P&L, to our EBITDA. So for about a year, year and a half, we just had the business get used to this, this, this KPI, this measurement, uh, by, through our, through our uh, financial reporting and through our CapEx decision making. And as of this year, we've introduced it as an incentive for senior leadership. So 120 me and 119 other senior leaders now have a long-term incentive, part of which is linked to th the extent to which sustainable EBITDA is equal to our EBITDA going forward. So, you know, going back to the question that Colin asked me five, six years ago, what problem do you exist uh, to solve profitably, the problem we exist to, to, to solve uh, is to create meaningful connections, and we measure that the way we do that through the uh, through at the macro level, through the measurement of our sustainable everyday. Because at the end of the day, business exists to solve problems, but it, business needs to make money; otherwise, businesses have no reason to be. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks very much indeed, Paolo. So two, I think, key messages that come through from there. The first one is to relate the metrics directly to the purpose, in this case of meaningful connections, and note that those are measures in relation to, if you like, social elements of, uh, as well as environmental. Uh, and the second key element is then, in addition, related to the profit. So you talked about including this in the EBITDA measures of the company so that it's actually reflected in the cost structure and therefore the profits on which people are rewarded within the organization. Yeah, maybe I can talk about some of the social measures as we get into the Q&A later. It would be very helpful if you could. That's great. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, Kartik, would you like to come in at this point? Uh, I'm happy to, but I thought uh, sorry, Geiske no, no, you're was right. I've got it the wrong way. Sorry, sorry, Geiske. I have some slides. Is there a pointer? There's the clicker. Can we have the slides up? Uh, 
and the All right, so I'm going to talk about um, two aspects uh, of the discussion or two topics that we agreed that would be, uh, let's say, informative for the discussion. The first one is going to be uh, the use of ESG metrics in compensation contracts. The second one is going to be the integration of, uh, let's say, sustainability reporting and financial reporting. Okay? So on the, on the first one, I'm going to be very brief, right? But this is from a, a recent study that we have conducted using a large sample of firms, thousands of firms uh, from all over the world. And this is basically, you know, the tendency that you see in terms of the usage of uh, ESG compensation, uh, ESG metrics in compensation contracts. Uh, now, uh, just to make sure that you know, it, it is clear what we are talking about, uh, this is an example from Schneider Electric. So on top of, let's say, the usual suspects here, financial metrics, you would have let's say, a, a, a sustainability metric that they produce from themselves. That would be, a, let's say, a, a, a self-produced sort of index. And then they also use, uh, let's say, ESG ratings, so produced by an external agency, okay, in the short term of the contract and the long term part of the, of the contract. And now this is basically, you know, to illustrate, this is the, the, the index that they use. Um, so it's basically a, a bunch of KPIs that they would sort of like consolidate within an index uh, uh, using some sort of weighting, right? So now, I mean, uh, what could be the reasoning of this, right? I mean, uh, you know, this is basically what we do in the study, you know, sort of like, let's try to figure out why people might not be doing this or, or why people might be doing this. And I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts about this later on in the colloquium if, if there's time. So, I mean, of course, an obvious uh, reason not to do this is that, I mean, you are skeptical about ESG, right? So if that's the case, uh, end of the conversation. But it might be the case that there are firms out there that are very sensitive to ESG, and uh, they would say, no, we are not using this, right? Well, because ESG is a must, because it's already on, on, on your salary, uh, because we have other incentives. And, uh, you know, some people here have talked about maybe non-monetary incentives, right? You know, reputation, you might be concerned about, let's say, uh, social activists out there, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, or because ESG metrics are just too noisy, okay? So we, don't, we, we cannot rely on them uh, uh, for something as serious as compensation, okay? Uh, or maybe because financial metrics already do the job, okay? So you, know, you would say, well, I'm, I'm giving this person some stock compensation. Stock price is a forward-looking measure. It would, let's say, pick up basically whatever ESG metric uh, is going to pick up, okay? But then, you know, on the other side of, of the debate, we would say, well, but we, we might want to do this, uh, let's say, for economic reasons. Uh, maybe, you know, one argument could be related to performance measurement. You, you would say, well, financial metrics have limitations, both accounting metrics and, 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 and the stock price, too, right? So, I mean, limited ability, you know, to maybe predict certain things that are going to happen in the future. Maybe these ESG metrics are going to tell me something that the usual financial metrics are not going to be able to, to tell me, okay? Uh, or maybe, you know, uh, the board might think, okay, I'm not sure whether ESG is going to be, let's say, value increasing. Uh, it might be a net cost for us. But precisely because of that, uh, we, need to, we need to do it because we have some pressure or because maybe not doing it is going to be even, even worse or because, uh, well, you know, we have the conviction that this, this needs to happen, right? Precisely because this is going to be costly, we need incentives. Otherwise, this is not going to happen. And maybe a third argument would be, well, there could be some signaling here, okay? So basically, you know, by providing uh, this, this type of, com of, of compensation, uh, I'm, se I'm sending a very strong signal to the market that I'm serious about all these, let's say, environmental commitments that I'm making and so on and so forth, that perhaps might not be credible uh, without this. This is a very strong signal, a costly signal, because it affects people, uh, people's money, people's pockets. It is, it is serious, right? All right. So, uh, but then maybe it could be there could be a, a fourth argument of doing this uh, that is let's let's say less benevolent. Uh, and this could be some sort of like opportunism, right? Yet another way to basically extract rents from shareholders, right? So I'm gonna give the, the, the CEO these metrics that are gonna be you know all these targets that are gonna be manipulable by me. That is gonna be you know hard to hit, right? And and then you know it, it's a way of sort of like securing some some uh, some compensation. All right, so uh, this is what we find, okay? So what we find in this study is that at least there is some evidence that this sort of like three economic rationales have some bearing in the data, okay? Um, 
we also find that uh, when they uh, adopt this compensation practice, there's an increase in ESG performance, basically measured by ESG ratings. We could, we could uh, discuss whether this is, this is a, 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 a good metric or not, but this is what we find. And also we find that, the, let's say, the, the, the adoption of uh, this compensation practice is sort of associated with, with lower uh, financial uh, returns, okay? uh, both in, in, in terms of accounting performance and in terms of market performance. Now, very briefly on the second topic that I, wanna, I, I wanted to touch on here, the integration of ESG into financial reporting. So I guess one important thing here is, uh, let's say, the recognition of certain sustainability issues into financial statements. Okay, here you have some examples, a regulatory change that renders inventories obsolete. Okay, so I, I should probably, you know, modify somehow uh, these this inventory numbers, right? Or, or we, could, we could debate whether, whether I should do this, right? What seems to be like uh, you know clear is that regulators are pushing in this direction here is a quote from esma and uh, you know it looks like they are determined uh, for this to happen okay now uh, another aspect of this is uh, let's say new assets that are let's say appearing out there because of the green transition uh, one example is uh, what we could call carbon allowances or the rights or the emission rights, right? So basically, you know, you're probably familiar with this. There is a market, uh, there is a market for emissions. And uh, this is, uh, I want to go back here. Let's see. Here, so there is a market for uh, for emissions. Uh, so there is a, ca a cap and trade system. The regulator the regulator puts a cap, and then you know emits these rights, and then people based on their emission needs, they are going to trade with each other. That there is going to be price discovery, right? Okay, so this is not something that is happening in Europe. You probably know that this is expanding and there are, there are new uh, developments like this all over the world, right? So it's becoming like a, a really big deal. So now there's a bunch of accounting questions related to this, right? So I mean, what type of asset is this emission allowance? What is the nature of any liability created uh, for a participant in a, in a, in a, in a cap-and-trade system? Uh, which measurement approach best reflects the economic effects of, of emission allowances? Uh, should we value this at fair value? or at book value? And are there any real effects of the accounting treatment? I mean, if we, uh, let's say, impose a certain accounting treatment, is this generating some behavior that could also have spillovers on other markets and, and specifically on the, on the carbon market, affecting carbon prices and, and therefore affecting, let's say, our efforts you know, to decarbonize? All right, so, and then this is, this is the last slide. I mean, uh, on, on the connectivity between financial and sustainability re reporting, I guess... I mean, there is, there is already some initial evidence out there, some studies based on sort of like a small, a small samples that suggest that there is not much connectivity. There are some people complaining uh, about like, for example, you know, a company saying certain things in the sustainability report that don't show up in the financial statements, right? You know, some sort of like seemingly, uh, let's say, inconsistencies. Uh, now, I guess the question is, uh, I mean, if there is, sort of like not enough disclosure on this, if people are not doing this at the, at the level that they should be doing it, why is this? Okay, so I mean, uh, is, is it some sort of agency here? Uh, you know, some sort of you know, something related to reporting incentives, maybe lack of effort? Is it because the, regulate, the regulation, the current rules are not clear or make it difficult because there is, there is a principle, accounting principle that is called conservatism and maybe, you know, this principle just doesn't allow me, you know, to, to put certain things in the financial statements. Is it that, uh, you know, it's about production cost? Okay, so you know, some firms do not have enough resources, you know, to, 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 to model, to quantify certain things. We are talking about, you know, things that require, let's say, pretty sophisticated modeling, right? Uh, or is it that we just don't know how to do it and we, we, we need to learn how to do this, right? I think this, this is an open question. This is actually an ongoing uh, research project that I have with some, some other colleagues. Uh, I am not able to provide a, an answer for this yet because we still don't have the evidence, but I think that these are, these are open questions and, and these could, could be questions that could also, uh, we could also discuss during, the, during the, the colloquium. Thank you so much. Great, that was excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Could you just clarify, um, to what extent, in relation to your last slide in particular, do you think that these issues are going to be solved by standardization and what the International Sustainability Standards Board of the IFRS are doing in this area in terms of trying to essentially standard 
standardized reporting. And, and it relates to a broader question. Of, does one, in thinking about corporate purpose and the measurement of corporate purpose, do we need standards to really ensure that there's consistency across companies? I just welcome your quick thoughts on that. Uh, am I supposed to answer that? It, it's a big question. <laughs> okay, so I'll do, I'll, do, yeah, I'll do my best. I mean, you know, very briefly. Uh, Mm, very briefly, I don't know, uh, because we still don't have evidence, right? So, so depending, depending what is the, 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 the let's say, the, the, the dominating friction there, we might need regulation or not, right? I mean, if it's an agency friction, right, that people are not doing this and it's sort of like opportunistically, uh, I think that regulation uh, would be very welcome and it, it might actually, you know, solve uh, this sort of like market failure, right? But if it's, you know, these other frictions uh, that I put on the slide, I think, I mean, if this is the dominant effect, I think that uh, it is not clear that we, we need regulation. And it, it looks like there's going to be regulation on this because there, there are talks on the uh, ISSB and uh, on, on IFRAC, you know, to, to, to introduce rules in this, in this regard. On the purpose, uh, I would defer that to, to, the, to the colloquium because I think that this is, this is a, this, I mean, answering this question is going to require a little bit more time. Okay. Great. Okay. At this point, I will bring you in, Kartik. So over to you. Thank you, Colin, and uh, I take it you can all hear me. Um, so uh, um, I'm delighted to be here. I only uh, uh, apologize for not being there in person. I very much enjoy visiting Copenhagen. My husband is half Danish, uh, but unfortunately I was uh, called away to New York uh, in the very last minute, so that's where I'm speaking to you from. Um, so I come to this topic uh, uh, from a somewhat different perspective. Um, about uh, 10 years ago, I wrote a book on um, chicanery in accounting regulation, in financial accounting regulation, and uh, that's an area that I was very interested in, and particularly how, despite you know the wealth of capital market institutions and regulation that exists in that space, um, you know the kind of uh, financial chicanery that we would expect would be minimal continues to persist. Um, and so uh, as I saw sort of the ESG uh, um, reporting revolution take off, I was um, quite uh, surprised because I um, wondered, you know, I mean, the level of chicanery in ESG must be uh, order of magnitude uh, greater than what you see in financial regulation because, or in financial reporting, because the institutions that uh, support this kind of ESG reporting are much weaker and the regulation is almost non-existent. So that's the perspective that um, I've come at this from. And a couple of years ago, I fell into the world of carbon accounting um, quite by uh, accident. And, um, you know, I was astonished that, um, you know, uh, the world has been trying to address the problem, the existential challenge of climate change, using largely what are um, standards that uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol and the ISO and others have put out that wouldn't meet basic definitions of accounting. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that we've tried to uh, work on in the last couple of years through a research project that I've been working on with uh, Bob Kaplan uh, at Harvard Business School is um, to clarify the distinction between accounting and disclosure. So there's a lot of effort in this space that um, qualifies as uh, disclosure, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with the SEC language, this would be the stuff that's reported under Reg uh, SK, which is the stuff in the management discussion and analysis where management tells you all the wonderful things that they might do in the future. Um, but very little of the stuff we see in ESG, in particular in climate, uh, actually qualifies as what we consider accounting. This is, again, the language of the SEC, uh, Reg SX. Uh, this is the stuff you would see in the audited financial statements. So we set off to create a set of accounting principles that would work in the space of climate. Uh, one of the things that uh, I will assert at this stage uh, we won't have time to get into is that some of these principles will work for any kind of fungible metric in the ESG space outside of GHG emissions. A lot of the work we've done is in measuring GHG emissions at the level of uh, individual products, transactions, entities, and then whole economies. Um, but this could equally apply to things like, um, you know, uh, water usage, to uh, things like, um, you know, indentured labor in supply chains, anything that's actually fungible and countable. And I will submit for the purposes of this conversation um, that there are uh, three stages, three um, uh, levels at which you need to um, be uh, building uh, sound counting principles into the measurement 
ESG or corporate purpose or whatever it is um, you uh, want to focus on. Uh, the first is at the individual entity level. You want metrics that are both accurate and verifiable. And by accurate, we mean that they are actually representationally faithful. It means that the measure is actually representing what it purports to measure. And a lot of what you see, for instance, under scope three reporting, greenhouse gas protocol, fails to meet this definition of accuracy. The uh, second element at the entity level is verifiability. And of course, if something is not accurate, it's not verifiable either. So um, unless something is auditable or verifiable, uh, it cannot be used in anything that involves managing, mitigating principal agent conflicts, uh, as Geiska was mentioned earlier. And so if you want to use kind of metrics and things like performance contracts and uh, compensation contracts and debt covenants, et cetera, you need some element of verifiability that lodges on to the accuracy. So those are the two principles at the entity level, accuracy and verifiability. Um, once you start looking at it at the level of um, uh, sort of uh, markets, you're looking for two further principles. One is comparability and the other is simplicity. Uh, uh, comparability is the idea that something that is produced at the level of one entity or one transaction is comparable with something that happens at another entity or another transaction. Again, scope three is designed in a way that you can't compare two entities scope three numbers. So it's completely useless for any kind of market evaluation uh, at a structural level. Uh, and uh, But the, uh, the flip side of comparability is that it needs to be simple. Sense. We need this to operate at the level at which um, retail users of uh, uh, information about corporate performance can actually make decisions on it. So to paraphrase Einstein, everything should be made as simple as possible, uh, but no simpler. Uh, and, and so that would be, those would be the two principles we uh, emphasize at the market level. And then the final uh, set of principles, at the um, sort of structural or systemic level, would be that the measures should be both mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. So when you're counting something, you should count it only once, and you should count it so that the sum across all of the elements that you count in a society adds up the total uh, in the world, uh, which is to say that if we're counting emissions across entities, we should be counting those emissions only once. And when we count up and add up all of the emissions across all the entities, they should add up to all of the emissions we've put out into the atmosphere in a given reporting period. Again, on this process, on, on these two very, very basic metrics of mutual exclusivity and collective exhaustive, exhaustivity, uh, the greenhouse gas profile fails because it's neither mutually exclusive nor collectively exhaustive. So um, again, think about these six very, very basic accounting principles that uh, I've talked about, accuracy, verifiability, comparability, simplicity, mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. And the very basis of our approach to measuring uh, uh, carbon emissions and therefore managing climate change fails almost all of these principles, which gives you a sense of the degree or of despair and the degree of dysfunction in the ESG space. It, in perhaps the one area of the ESG space where you would expect that the dysfunction would be least. So it's just perhaps the tip of the iceberg, the number of measurement challenges that remain out there and so I suppose there's no surprise if you look at this kind of measurement uh, dysfunctionality that um, the vast majority of what currently trades as an offset, uh, what guys kept saying earlier, is actually junk. 95% of the offset markets uh, are actually completely trading in used assets, like high frequency trading perhaps. Um, and, and so one of the things that if we want to take this seriously, if we're really serious about climate change, we would hope that accounting rather than just voluntary disclosure a qualitative disclosure is the basis for how we make progress in this space. So with those uh, potentially uh, provocative remarks, I will turn it back to you. Okay, uh, Kartik, thanks very much. Um, just to give people a quick indication of the way in which you and Bob Kaplan have, I think, very neatly tried to address this. In essence, what I think you're both proposing is essentially just a value-added notion. To what extent does a company uh, create value added or one should describe it as value liabilities uh, in relation to environmental uh, detriment and uh, that that's basically the way in which you see this as being solved is that correct that, that that's correct uh, that is a um, that was not a design feature of uh, how we started off with it but when we said okay we need for a system we were starting from the bottom up and we said we want a system that's accurate verifiable comparable simple mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted 
then the system we designed is one that effectively looks like uh, instead of value added, it's value subtracted, because of course you have an emissions liability with nature when you put emissions out into the atmosphere, but that would be the basic mechanism on which it would operate. So it's the same logic on which we GDP operates in context of the economic performance uh, of countries would have operate uh, this, but it's a bottom up measure. If, you, if you're interested in learning more, I would direct you to e-liability.institute, yeah. uh, which is where uh, we've got all of our papers for free. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Judith, let me uh, turn to you. Yes, thank you very much, Colin. And um, all three um, are really, really tough acts to follow, um, but, uh, but, I, but I will try and I will come from a slightly, slightly different angle. Um, before I do that, let me apologize for not being there as well. Uh, our semester starts early in Switzerland and I was pulled into teaching that was uh, unforeseeable. And so here I am um, doing what I'm supposed to do, but I'm very happy um, I'm, also, I'm also able to join online. So the, the angle that I want to come from is, is the management angle. I think um, Geiska and, and Kartik already really, really eloquently talked about the accounting piece um, and, and all the difficulties, but also potential solutions that are out there. Now, um, I've been working with, with Colin and, and some other colleagues on various case studies around implementation of corporate purpose for the last several years, and, and the measurement question obviously always comes up. Um, and one of the things that I think I've realized after you know, looking at various different cases is that one of the problem with measuring purposes is, is that we really try to essentially measure everything and that simply does not work. Right. So um, one of the suggestions that we would bring forward is to really try and think about measures in relation to functions and logics of actions and not just measure for the purpose of measurement. So it really is about thinking about this problem that um, uh, that both Paolo talked about, but that also sort of inherent in the definition of purpose that, that Colin puts forward. Um, that's obviously also one of the problems of the ESG movement, right? It does try to measure everything. It does so insufficiently and, and not very um, um, not very comparably, um, which leads to inefficiencies on the reporting side and also leads to cost arguments and problems within organizations, particularly sort of medium sized businesses that more and more are expected to also report on on everything without really having that strategic component um, that, that is so important when it when we talk about purpose. Um, additionally, I think there is um, a lot of merit to thinking about measurement in relation to financial performance uh, because we know organizations have to be profitable to actually be able to deliver on their purpose. But lately we see this being stretched often almost a little bit too far. And so I do want to be a little bit more provocative here and say that I think there are some false analogies to financial performance out there when we talk about sustainability or ESG as something that is also perceived as a performance. And it leads to us only thinking about it as a risk or an opportunity. And we sometimes lose the notion of externality and, and impact. So if we only think about it as a financial concept, then we think about the growth of green capital, but we don't really think about the um, green externalities that are sort of attached to that and the question of how we in action, in activity, actually reduce those. So how do we go about that? Um, uh, there's a few things that I think we need to think about when we think about measuring purpose. And one of them, and this is exactly what Paolo said, is about going from profit as an end to profit as a means. I think this, this is no surprise in the discussion. This is something that, that everyone is very much aware about, but it still doesn't really happen. It's not something that is very deeply embedded um, in, in many businesses. So it is worth to think about what does it actually mean if we use profit as a means, right, for achieving whatever purpose um, we put out to achieve. It also, I think, means to really think more about ecosystems. So there is still this very strong firm-centric or, if you will, egocentric view that we have around measurement. And I don't just mean sort of this 
uh, elusive concept of double materiality here. I actually do mean really thinking through impact pathways, thinking about the stakeholders that are involved, and really embracing the com complexity of this topic, right? Um, so what are we creating value for? Who are we creating value for? What does that value look like, both on the social, environmental, and perhaps even on the financial side? So it really is about sort of trying to capture the complexity of topics that are involved when we talk about purpose. Now, all of that obviously is a lot. And so one of the things that I think is really, really important is to embrace radical prioritization. So one of the things that I have become increasingly frustrated with is the discussion around materiality. Uh, materiality is this concept that now pops up in, in you know, sustainability reporting, financial materiality, uh, double materiality. Essentially, businesses can decide what is material to them. I think the, the assessment of materiality can, if done well, be a very useful tool, but it does not prioritize well enough for businesses what they should focus on in terms of their purpose. At the end of the day, you have a sort of prioritization of all issues and not really a selection of the most important issues, which can then be focused on in all of its complexity um, and in all of its difficulty in terms of managing when we want to managing purpose. So this topic around how do we prioritize radically and therefore also how do we deprioritize perhaps certain issues that are less important, I think is something that is an uncomfortable topic, but it is a really important topic if we want to do it well. I think this also speaks to what Kartik said in terms of really doing something in exhaustiveness, doing it well. So what I love about your system is that in its simplicity, when you add everything up, it actually shows all of the complexity of supply chains and business models. And that's exactly where we need to get. But we will not get there if we try to measure and manage everything at the same time. I do also think, um, I'm going to close with that. Um, there's two things that I think will be really interesting about this. If we do say we manage purpose according to radical priorities, then we may actually enable businesses to really go for the high hanging fruits in terms of sustainability and really also capture value and opportunities in that area. The second thing is that I think uh, prioritization is really, really important also for boards and the fiduciary duty of boards, because again, to be able to really manage something well, you need to be able to appreciate and the complexity of a topic, but you will never be able to appreciate the complexity of all topics that are out there. And so prioritization, really radical prioritization beyond materiality and analyses as they now um, are in every sustainability report, I think is really important to, to measure and manage purpose well. And I'll leave it there. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Judith. Um, so from what I heard you just saying, I think what you're implying is that what uh, Paolo has put forward as a way of implementing measurement in Asahi is consistent with the notion of what you're putting forward as a focusing on the function of the organization and that what Kartik is putting forward in terms of thinking about how to evaluate environmental and other liabilities is an appropriate way of incorporating that in a functional form. So what I'd just like to pick up uh, as a discussion amongst uh, the panel uh, before we throw it open to general questions is whether or not between these two suggestions in terms of or illustrations uh, of what uh, is being done in Asahi in terms of specifically measuring the determinants and outcomes of the company's purpose and incorporating that in the profit, the EBITDA of the company, and what Kartik is putting forward in terms of measuring environmental and potentially social liabilities is a way in which one can actually move forward to measure uh, corporate purpose, because if that's the case, I think you know, that that's a really valuable outcome from this discussion. So perhaps I can just go to each of you as to whether or not you feel that this is a methodology, 
strategy that could be usefully employed in terms of taking forward the measurement of purpose agenda. Paolo, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Um, so first of all, I've got to say, it feels like my head's exploding uh, right now because uh, the, the, the whole issue of purpose and measurement is a big issue. Um, um, and while I think it is obviously imperative to be subjective, uh, uh, sorry, objective, clear, all the things that Kartik ma mentioned, and that, that's absolutely right. The danger I think we face uh, as, uh, as, as business is getting slowed down in doing the right thing, and by that I mean actually implementing purpose, um, waiting for the nth degree of accuracy uh, in, in, in measurement. So the choice we've made is not to wait. The choice we've made is to move forward to potentially start with or start with potentially a, um, a measure that we know to be not totally accurate, not totally consistent, potentially also questionable and questioned by our employees because we are touching their back pockets. But the choice is do nothing or start, and we've chosen to start. And through that starting, I promise you, the conversation around purpose has become alive, it's become real, it's become contentious, it's become, um, um, it, it, it's become part of the lexicon of the business. It's not just something that Paolo and a few other people were talking about in the business. So my, I don't have a, I don't have a, an absolute answer for, uh, for you. I, I would just counsel everybody just to start. Um, the other point I'd like to make is we talked a lot about ESG and the, uh, you know, how we measure, how we, how we account for those elements of purpose. But if you, if, I was very quick at the beginning, but we have two fundamental sort of sub goals. One's around planet positivity. The other one's around the impact we have on society. That's much more difficult to measure. That's always going to be a little bit more subjective. So, you know, again, radical prioritization, Judith, that's what we, I, I aim to do and aim, I think any good business aims to do all the time and it is difficult. But the two elements that we talk about when we talk, when we talk about the social angle of purpose is moving our business to reflect society as a whole. Uh, we, you know, society is made up broadly 50-50 male and female. My business is broadly made up at the executive level of males. So if we actually want to drive a more inclusive environment, we need to reflect what society around us looks like and move from the 26% of men, uh, sorry, of women in our business today at the executive level to something as close as possible to 50%. So gender equity is something we measure and we track and we, we value in our journey towards profit. We're an alcoholic beverage company. You know, some might ask, well, how can you be purposeful and sell alcohol? Well, I think we can be. Uh, I think the way we do that is by giving people actual choice. And by that, I mean providing non-alcoholic ver versions of our alcoholic beers. So we have a target of 20% of our portfolio by 2030 in the non-alcoholic space. It would be um, chicanery to pick up a word that, uh, that Kartik used earlier on, to sponsor Formula One, with, uh, which we do, uh, the Aston Martin team, with Peroni Zero Zero, and then not actually have programs in place to sell more Peroni Zero Zero to enable greater choice for consumers that want a great tasting beer, but just without the alcohol. So again, we have a, we have a, a metric in there around how much of our portfolio is in the non-alcoholic spa space, tracking towards that ambition of 20%. So it is really tough. It is really difficult. But the more we talk about how tough and difficult it is, the less we talk about the implementation of moving forward. And that's what we've done as a business. Yes, I think that the, the distinction made before <clears throat> In prior sessions on the negative and the positive side, if uh, you allow me this language of, of purpose, I think is very useful here. On the negative side, I mean, we, I mean, meaning externalities, right? I think that um, methodolog methodological approaches like Cartix uh, are immensely useful uh, because uh, it, it's it's about capital, right? I mean, you know, the concept of let's say natural capital or capitals is something that it also shows up in in, in Judith's uh, work. 
and uh, it is it is really about that, right? Um, when we when, when we uh, talk about externalities, I mean now, I mean we have taken the first step, which is carbon emissions. Um, maybe I mean if this works out and we learn how to do this, maybe we could we could do this for other types of capital. Um, but it, I mean it's, it's not it's not going to be easy. Now I mean if you ask me, okay, do, do we need a separated reporting system for purpose? Um, that I'm not sure about. Um, perhaps on the positive side, we want to be a little bit more selective when it comes to purpose because uh, we might want to focus on our attention on, on one, maybe one specific capital that is, uh, let's say, more closely related to purpose. Maybe we can accommodate, let's say, the, 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 the measuring needs or the reporting needs related to purpose uh, with, uh, let's say, the existing, uh, let's say, reporting systems that are being developed uh, um, for, let's say, other dimensions of ESG. In any case, I think that, I mean, when it comes to reporting, it is very, very important to distinguish between, I would say, three sources of demand for, for sustainability information or non-financial information. One would be, let's say, um, the demand from internal managers. So we, and they need information to run the company. This would be similar to, let's say, the man, a managerial uh, accounting system uh, that is not subject to, to, to financial accounting rules, for example. The other one would be external reporting uh, for decision maker purposes, okay, so like shareholders or stakeholders that might make decisions based on this information that is publicly released. That it's a completely different ball game, right? Because uh, there are certain, let's say, problems or frictions uh, that uh, do not exist in, in the case of, uh, let's say, internal information, right? So then it maybe if it's, if it's about, let's say, developing an internal uh, reporting system for the purpose of let's say, internal de decision making, one might have way many more uh, degrees of freedom because uh, you know, probably reliability is not going to be that, uh, such a big deal. And the third one is contracting. Okay, so and contracting uh, either managerial compensation or debt contracts. We already uh, are seeing debt contracts that depend on, on sustainability metrics. Uh, for that, we also need to, to, you know, to be careful and think about whether in this sustainability reporting or this purpose uh, reporting, we need you know, certain principles that we use in, in, in financial accounting, like, for example, conservatism, that precisely respond to, uh, let's say, contracting needs. So uh, I, I, let, let me just reiterate um, a couple of things that I think have already been said. Um, uh, and I want to sort of distinguish between perhaps the need to quantify um, uh, metrics when it comes uh, to sort of admissions versus maybe other dimensions of purpose. I believe I, uh, and uh, if I fully uh, understood Paolo's arguments, uh, that we might be on the same page. I don't think we need to be quantifying all of the dimensions of purpose. And I uh, like Paolo's uh, spirit, okay, let's just get on with the job and let's do what we need to do. And um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and, and I think that that's very sensible and that should be the approach uh, when we think about purpose more broadly. When it comes to the climate space and particularly GAG emissions, I think the need for a system that's mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive is really important because uh, otherwise what we see with a lot of the of approaches, um, uh, and, and we've seen this in our pilot uh, companies, is uh, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. So simply saying the emissions are not on my balance sheet doesn't solve the problem of geological net zero. We're all in the same boat. And if we said, if the company simply said, oh, well, at least my emission, my balance sheet is clean, my uh, e-liabilities are clean, that's not helping anyone. So the reason to have a system that's mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive is that we're counting emissions of molecules in the atmosphere. And unless we're actually reducing the net emissions of GHG molecules in the atmosphere, we're saving nothing. So just, you know, and that's, I think, the, the big problem, the existential challenge carbon offset markets right now. A lot of companies that have spent billions of dollars on, uh, on, on uh, so-called carbon offsets have really just been engaging in moving some emissions from one balance sheet to the next. Uh, you know, there are companies like Tesla that um, have a substantial fraction of their profits really come from shifting, uh, you know, uh, effectively subsidies 
from one uh, uh, entity to the next. It's, it's, it's not clear that that's actually helping the problem of climate change. So that's the dimension where I would say the, the get, getting a system that actually counts emissions of GHG molecules is critically important. The rest of the stuff on purpose, I think, is less urgent uh, in terms of an accuracy perspective. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I, I think I agree with everything that has been said. Um, what I just wanted to say I really love about the example, Paolo, um, that you guys pose is the fact that you are an example of experimentation, right? You just kind of went with it. You said, we'll see what works and what doesn't work. And there's actually a a lot to be said for that and it also goes to sort of this this topic around how do we prioritize because once we prioritize within that topic we may actually be able to just try stuff out once we don't try to do everything at the same time we can sort of allocate resources and see what works and so i think that's a really really nice um, element of, of your example um to quickly come back to the sort of this um subjectivity versus objectivity what needs to be standardized i mean i completely agree with it there are certain things that we need to get right and and ghg emissions and climate change are are up there right um so i think there is a lot to be said for the fact that liabilities ideally in the form that kartik and and bob suggest them are standardized and are fully reported by every company I think on the value side, sort of this this positive element, as, as you um, called it, um, Geispa, is that uh, it's it's less important to standardize it. And I actually think it's not even interesting to standardize it, because if we talk about it from an investor perspective, um, you want to analyze and you you want to understand where the value comes from, not in the way that the company tells you where the value comes from, but but the way that you think the value sits within the market and the value creation of the organization itself. And so I think, yes, there should be reporting around purpose, but I don't see any need for it to be fully standardized. I think it would actually lose its value if we were to do that. I think what we need to learn to do is talk more about it, more efficiently about it. So a couple of years back, we did do a research project with investors where we asked them about corporate purpose, whether they think it's important or not. And, and the, the big majority said, yeah, we think it's, it's great. We think it's a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing and we think it helps companies. We just have no idea how to assess it. Right. So, so clearly there needs to be a conversation around what do we need when we talk about purpose? What is it? How can we assess it? How does it feed into value creation? So, so companies should feed into that conversation with what they report. But again, I don't think standardization would help with that at all. So it, it does need to be a balance between the value part, which is idiosyncratic, and then, and then I think the liability part, which, which certainly needs to be standardized. Great, thank you very much indeed. So we'll move over to Q&A at this point, and there are two people who are going to make an intervention, first of all. Birgit Olsen, if you'd like to just stop. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come here today. I feel a little bit like uh, the lawyer who is uh, party crashing, a party with the uh, uh, corporate governance people. Uh, because what I'm what I'm listening to here is that which I think is it's a very interesting discussion, but the thing is that right now in uh, in the EU, uh, we actually have a lot of regulation. So um, the purpose-driven business, uh, the reporting uh, paradigms, they are already there, and they are actually already legal uh, requirements. So uh, we have the EU taxonomy where you will have to report on your negative impact on the environment and providing also information about your CAPEX and OPEX, uh, uh, the costs that are linked uh, to uh, the, uh, the handling of your uh, negative effect on the environment. We also have now the uh, EU Directive on Corporate Sustainability Reporting and a standard. And the standard is very interesting, I think, in this context because it provides you with uh, a lot of tools, methodologies, so you would have to report. There's a lot of data points, there are metrics too, that will help you identify how you actually uh, account for your negative impact on environment, society, uh, and people, but and also account for your positive impact 
uh, on environment and society and people. So I think what we talk about here is not, at least in an EU context, it's, it's not so much about do we need a standard, do we need regulation, it's already there. And we are starting to implement it. And from you mentioned it a little bit, uh, Judith, by, by saying that you were not so fond of the materiality assessments, the double materiality, but I think it's a fantastic idea. This allows you for, and in your brewery, for instance, you could um, assess and document, report on your negative impact on environment and social issues. But you, don't, you could also take the positives in and, and say you actually have a positive influence on uh, social activities, social interactions. And you could measure that, also the, the outcome, your results from that, your, how it helps you to get access to capital and so forth. That's everything is within this uh, EU paradigm. Uh, so I think it's, it's an important contribution to actually working with purpose in a more strategic way. And as an advisor, I'm with the uh, CAF Consulting here in Copenhagen, and as an advisor to multinational and Danish companies, we always use this compliance approach, which, is, which it is, to enlighten and uh, provide input to the, to the strategic purpose uh, process. Because you can actually use your double materiality assessment to pinpoint where is it that we can make a difference, both for society and environment, but also on the bottom line. Uh, so in that way, I think it goes hand in hand, working with sustainability and purpose within that framework and profitability. Thank you. Thanks very much. Judith, would you like to just respond to that at all? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, you're absolutely right, of course. Um, there's a lot happening on the regulatory side. Um, I'm afraid I'm not as optimistic about it as you, I think, um, but but I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, the taxonomy, for example, is very incomplete, right? Lots of businesses only are, I think, 30% eligible, and then the rest of it is actually not going to be reported Um the CSRD has also been watered down quite significantly. Um, if we sort of see what's happening in the last couple of months only. Um, there's a lot of things that were originally there that are not there anymore. So I completely agree that there's it goes in the right direction, right? I do think, however, that I mean, I think ideally the compliance piece that is now being set in place will feed into strategy, right? Unfortunately, I don't think that's what we see yet. So we need to really work on it and think about how can we make that happen. So there is a really um, piece of research that, for example, looks at materiality disclosure. Um, so just those little um, sort of mattresses that we see in all of the reports now um, and assesses whether or not these materiality mattresses have actually been used in prioritization of strategic action. Things like capital allocation, projects that have been run afterwards, etc. And there's almost no relationship. So it, beg it begs the question, is this a reporting exercise of what we think is important or do we actually use it for our decision making? So if it's the latter, it's great. Particularly double materiality, I think, gives us a lot of insights. But if it's the former, it's a problem, right? And so I, I do think great if we have the framework, but we need to think really critically about how we make it work in the right way for us. Thank you. Christiana, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I come from, uh, I'm an associate professor in management control here at the accounting department here at CBS. So I come from the accounting literature. And I would say there has been a, a huge interest in impact assessment, as Judith said, and also in how companies can give back uh, to society, how you capture the value that actually is uh, is given back to society in that sense. And I wonder whether um, you think that measures like the, the social return on investment, for example, or this kind of, of elements that are becoming more and more ingrained in uh, corporate practice, also from a public and private perspective, will have uh, an impact so that we don't decouple uh, between the internal performance management system and the external uh, reporting practices in that sense. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, Paolo, do you, would you like to have a go? Yeah, so look, <laughs> I, I'm sort of with Judith on the, on the, 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 the practicalities of the, the frameworks that are out there today. They, 
uh, they, they tend to be used for, for compliance uh, as opposed to for decision making. And if, if an organization's actually going to be purposeful and live its purpose, then it's all, it's all about, the, for, for me, it's all about the decisions we make. Um, and I'm okay to have uh, subjective, not 100% uh, perfect information because that's life. That's, that's my life. That's the way we make decisions on a, on a daily basis. Uh, I just want to come back to, to Kartik's point earlier on. I'm 100% 100 aligned. There are some elements, specifically in climate, that have to be 100% objective, 100% clear. Uh, the whole the whole story of carbon offsets uh, is is a messy one to say the least. In terms of giving back, um, I I'm not a big fan of those two words used together. I think I think an organisation like ours needs to needs to create positive impact through what it does. Giving back uh, tends to be heard by the organization as something else that we do. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the, the, the point 100%, but that's, it's, not a lex, it's not language we, we, we tend to use, but maybe we can pick that up afterwards in Italian. <laughs> Yes, my name is Carsten Rode. I'm a professor in management accounting. I also come here from CBS. And, and one thing I, I wonder a little bit about is you can say the discussion about purpose, because that debate seems to be quite old in a sense. And, and to me, you can say when you talk about corporate purpose, is that the same as a mission of the company, or is it something different? I wasn't here this morning, so you can say that may have clarified, you can say, what it is. But, but to me, I think you could say the discussion about purposes has been out there, so, so to speak. And if you take, for example, Bob Kaplan, he, he started out, you can say, in his balance scorecard saying, okay, we have a mission, vision, we have a strategy, and then we decompose that into different kind of objectives, which is, you can say, that may be considered as different kind of purposes. So, so what is the difference, that's my question, what is the difference between corporate purposes and a mission of the company? I've personally stopped talking about vision and mission. It's all very confusing. When I talk, when I talk about, if, I, if this was a group of new inductees to our business, I would say the reason we exist, our greater why is our purpose. We exist to create meaningful connections. How we do that is articulated through our strategic framework. So yeah, we have a, a very simple uh, planet, portfolio, people, and profit uh, strategic framework. And who we are, how we are, is, is embedded in the, our values and our, our behaviors. And our behaviors are articulated, again, very simply, in empowering, collaborative, committed, curious, and uh, I've forgotten the fifth one, but there you go. Sometimes that happens. Um, so I think the, I, I actually think personally that the, the whole vision, mission, uh, values structure is old. I think that we should be moving towards a simpler articulation <clears throat> of why we exist, what problems are, do we, are we solving in the world profitably, how are we going to do that through our strategic framework, and who are we as a business, uh, what is our culture? I don't know if that answers your question exactly, exactly but that's how we think about it in, uh, in Asahi. Great. Okay, well that's, uh, I think, uh, a very good point at which to and this panel, we've overrun our time, so I'm afraid we won't be able to uh, take any more questions. Um, but it brings us right back to uh, the uh, purpose of this conference and what it is that we are trying to do in terms of promoting purposeful companies. Uh, and so at this point, I'll thank our panelists uh, and I'll ask Steen to come up to uh, give some closing remarks. So thank you very much indeed to all four of you. I saw you taking notes, Colin. A lot of notes here on your computer. So you really recorded almost everything which took place, which is very nice. So I, I guess we have food for thought for, for, for several days here. 
I think I would like to focus in my own feedback, I would like to focus on, on, on you know, the definition of what the purpose, you know, because we've been playing around with many, like, what is the difference between sustainability and purpose? This was a big discussion yesterday at the Young Scholars Workshop. And, and basically, we can agree that there is a kind of symbiotic relationship because the way Colin defines purpose, it's only purpose if it adds value to society. And then to add value, we need to make sure that we have all angles covered, right? All sustainability angles, you know, all stakeholders, and so everything needs to be covered, right? So then that's good, right? But I think, honestly, I think this is a, an, a mistake. I think we need to be a little bit more humble. We will never cover all angles. So I think in this confusing world where we have many different objectives, you know, I think purpose is had got to do with what is it that we can do as a company. We cannot do everything, but we can contribute very much to some things which are probably related to our core business. And the, the, why do we need purpose if we have the word core business? We need to know where are we moving the core business? What is it? What is the journey? So purpose is forward-looking, sustainability is backward looking. It's a static concept. We want to restore, we want to prevent change from taking place. Purpose as the other direction, right? So that's a very important distinction here. So that, that's one thing. Then about, you know, where does purpose reside? We had many different definitions today. The board owns it, the owners own it. We need to have the employees own it. You know, we have, you know, and, and I, I'm I'm very skeptical that you can ignore what CEOs say about the purpose. You know, this is a super mistake, I think. You know, because because you know, if we can't trust even what the CEOs say about what they think they do, you know, when they run the company, you know, then I, and and we as researchers are more clever than they are. You know, we know what the purpose is. It's a little bit. It reminds me about romanticism, when we had the idea of different countries. You know, the German spirit, the French spirit, something like that. And by the way, the philosophers they knew that spirit, but other people they didn't know, right? So it's completely subjective and really bad research, I think. So basically, we we cannot have it that it's so difficult that you cannot. You know, we need to trust basically the information that I, we get and. We might not be happy about it, but we need to use it. So basically, I'm thinking, well, is it really a big problem that we need all these actors? If you think about a wire, you know, there's a signal being sent from, let's say, the owners to the uh, board, to the management, down the organization. If that wire gets broken, an electrical circuit, at any place, the system will manufacture. You know, if, if the p employees don't know the purpose, of course. You cannot, but it can be broken in other places as well. It can be broken at the CEO level. It can be so. Basically, I think honestly, we need all these actors. It like you know, uh, so so I I don't see that as a major problem, that that, that we have it in in a, in a in a kind of holistic way. So um, so yeah, that my two bits. Great, thank you very much indeed, Steen. So. Uh, I'd just like to pick up on the points that you've made, which I think are absolutely right. Um, and in particular, to emphasize this notion, which I think has come across from today. And that is that there is a massive consensus around what we're trying to do. And that is that we are broadly looking to business to solve problems profitably and not to profit from creating problems. And that exactly as you were saying, Steen, it involves all the parties. It involves the employees, the corporate leaders, the owners, the other stakeholders, the suppliers, etc. Everyone has to pay their part in doing that. And I think that there were some very useful messages that came out from the various sessions in relation to the leadership one, it was about the importance of the clarity of purpose. Exactly your point about you can't do everything. You have to know what you're really focusing on and ensure that you take the company along with you and in particular the employees. The point about ownership was that uh, ownership is a key to determining what a company's purpose is if you've got the owners, if you've got those who've got significant blocks, the foundations are clearly doing that, and there are other models that can be used to provide that element of clarity to the role of ownership. 
and that investors in terms of really digging down to evaluating whether or not companies are fulfilling their purpose is a key role that they should be playing as well. And we heard in the session on law that this important distinction, which has come through a great deal during the course of the day in terms of the difference between the positive element of solving problems profitably and avoiding profiting from creating problems. That is very much a feature of the way in which the law is and should be operating going forward. And we saw that again in relation to the measurement and the distinction between what uh, um, Paolo was talking about in terms of implementation, getting on with the job of implementing the notion of meaningful connections in the business uh, meant using specific purpose measures that are relevant to Asahi's purpose as against avoiding the detriments associated with environmental liabilities, which needs a much more elaborate system of measurement to achieve that. So we've come out with, I think, a very clear set of ideas from a conference, which is actually quite a, an achievement for a one-day event. And what I hope will happen going forward is that we will take these ideas as to what it means to have a meaningful corporate purpose and what it takes to do it in terms of ownership, in terms of the involvement of investors, in terms of the law, in terms of measurement, and actually use this as a basis for really determining how we can give much more effect to purpose going forward. And I think this is a tremendous agenda for ECGI to use uh, as the basis of its responsible capitalism program. So I'd really just like to conclude by thanking all of you for having made this such an interesting and I think productive discussion. I didn't particular obviously like to thank everyone who's been involved in organizing this, uh, the team here at CBS uh, and the ECGI team uh, who've worked really amazingly hard on making this uh, conference such a success. Uh, and to you, Steen, for having uh, helped uh, really bring it all to life. Uh, thank you very much indeed to all of you. Uh, and I